you have your Bibles, we're going to be in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, the New Testament. Paul's letters to the church of Ephesus. You know, as I was preparing this message and as the Lord was leading, I realized that what's going on here, we're going to be covering the first eight verses in Ephesians chapter 5. And you're in for a real treat today. Not a trick or treat, okay? What I mean is that uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, some, some people, some pastors are calling us to be a preacher. And some people, God calls to be teachers. And I thank God that He's given me the gift of preaching and teaching. So what we, that's what we call the ministry, preaching. So you're going to hear some real preaching today. This is preaching and teaching. If I get that right, praise God. So we're going to cover the first eight verses. Whoa! And uh, I'm going to open with this uh, Ephesians five, chapter one, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter five, verse one. It says, "Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us." And hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let them not once be named among you as become saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not befitting, but rather giving thanks. Amen. For this we know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, which is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not therefore partakers with them. Final verse. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Amen. Praise God. In the, in the Apostle Paul's letters to the church of Ephesus, he makes a comparison between the children of God and the children of disobedience. Between the children of God and the children of disobedience. You're either a child of light or a child of darkness. It's your choice. Praise God. I hope we're all child of light. And it's what I call this message as the Lord gave me. Walk as children of light. Amen. Let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today. Lord, this message you have given me. that Lord, you anoint me to preach this message. Not of my flesh, but of your spirit. And I pray, Lord, to anoint them that they may hear. Lord, that it take root in their heart. And Lord, that I decrease, that you increase. It's not about me, Lord. It's all about you. And that you be exalted here, your son, Jesus Christ. And I ask in the mighty name of Jesus, be with us, Lord and Spirit. Let your spirit roam freely in this house today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Touch the hearts of those who hear. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Go back to one. Ephesians 5, verse 1. Paul tells us to be followers of God as dear children. What does he mean by that? Be followers of God. We understand that. Follow God. But as dear children. What does he mean? We can't, none of us can go back and be a child again. Except for Ava, of course. She's still a child. Amen. But, and this doesn't speak of being a child in a sense of immature. Does it mean you're being a spoiled little brat again? Does it, it, mean, it doesn't mean to act like a little kid. It says, Jesus explains this to his disciples in the book of Matthew. He says, his disciples said to Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The question should have been, how does one become the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? But they want to know who is the greatest. So Jesus called a little child to him, 
himself. Then placed him amongst them, and then said, Unless you be converted, converted, that means unless you are born again. You have to be born again. Jesus told that to Nicodemus. He said, Unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It means that you cannot comprehend the kingdom of God. It makes no sense unless you're born again. Of course, Nicodemus. <clears throat> Didn't understand that. It says, and become as this, be converted, and become as this little child. You shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Like I said, this isn't about being acting like a little kid anymore. This isn't about you playing with your little toys and things like that. You shall not enter the kingdom. Whosoever, Jesus said, goes on to tell us. Whosoever humbles himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Humble yourself as a little child. What does Jesus mean by that? What do you say? What is, let's, let's give the example. Children. We were all children at one time. Children have to what? Depend on their parents. They look to their parents. They lean on their parents. And so Jesus is saying, lean on your heavenly Father. Look to God for all things, not of yourself. And be like a little child that looks to his heavenly Father. Ephesians 5, 1 to verse 2. Paul tells us in verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Walk in love. I believe we sang the song earlier. We're a child of love, right? Walk in love as Christ has loved you. Christ loved you so much he died for you. He gave his life that you may live. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And had given himself right there. He gave himself. Christ willingly laid down his life. His blood wasn't spilled at Calvary. That would mean it was an accident. It was spilled. But no, his blood was poured out at Calvary. Amen. Poured out upon all men. If they'll simply believe and trust in him. Amen. Praise God. Be washed by the blood of the Lamb. That needs to be sanctified. Sanctified means to be washed clean by the blood of the Lamb and then be justified, declared clean. Amen. Amen. Praise God. He gave himself for us and an offering and a sacrifice to God, it says. For a sweet smelling savor, an offering. He was the sin offering. He was not sin. He did not become guilty of sin like some preach. Some people kind of hit on that today in the word for every day. Jesus did not become guilty of sin and go down to the burning side of hell like some pastors preach. That's, that's false doctrine. Jesus went to paradise. He told the thief on the cross, this day I will be with you in paradise. Amen. So he was the sin offering. And sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. A sweet smelling savor unto his heavenly father. What that means is that it satisfied God. It satisfied God the Father that his son would lay down his life to save the entire world. It brought joy to the heart of his father. I know that's hard, hard to wrap your head around, but God knew that. Billions could be saved now. Amen. Amen. The devil been defeated. But fornication, he goes down to verse 3. Paul warns about. He says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let them not once be amained among you as becometh saints. As you become saints of God, let not these things be part of your life to be named among you. The people can't look at you and see. Fornication. I think we all know what fornication is outside of marriage. Uncleanness and covetousness. Anything that's not of God is unclean. 
and coveting things. Coveting things that you're looking at your neighbor and saying, I want what he's got. I don't want, want I don't want something like he's got, I want what he's got. I don't want that. In other words, don't even talk about such things as sins. Don't let it leave your mouth. Only to be spoken of as a caution to someone. There's times that we're going to have to speak about things that I just listed there, that Paul listed, as to caution others not to get caught up in such things. But why would a Christian speak such, speak such evil things as the heathen does? See, Paul's speaking to Christians here. He's speaking to believers. He's not talking to heathens. So why is he telling why would Christians, why would believers want to talk like the heathen? Two reasons. The first reason, what I call corrupted grace. We're all living under grace if we're saved, under God's grace, made available by the cross. But what is corrupted grace? Corrupted grace is where people say, well, grace got to cover. My sins are covered. Paul addresses in Romans 6 by saying, asking the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Some people think that, well, to make grace abound, if I commit sin, grace is going to be poured out and continue to abound in my life. And I guess that keeps Jesus busy to keep pouring out his grace on my and cover my sins. No. Because Paul's reply was, God forbid, how shall we, who are dead to sin, think we can live any longer therein? How are we who are dead to sin? See, listen to what it says right there, dead to sin. Sin doesn't die. The sin nature still dwells in you. That ability to do the wrong thing, that desire to do the wrong thing, is still there. But you are, you are dead to it. It's not dead to you. You are dead to it. As long as you remain dead to it, it isn't going to keep coming up. Be dead to it. I think I hear somebody say, Yeah, somebody's beeping over here. It's your phone back here, Brandon. It is? I think so. Go ahead and take care of that, Brandon, and I'll continue on. Okay. So, corrupted grace. Second reason is, it's much like the first reason, they've erred in the cross. They don't understand the cross of Christ. They believe that dependence on the cross of Christ ended with their salvation experience. But when they got saved, they got washed by the blood of the Lamb, their, the cross ended there. So they continue to abound in their sin. And uh, it says, uh, look, I just talked about sanctified and justified. See, you understand there are two types of sanctification. The first one I spoke of was positional sanctification. When you got washed clean at conversion, you were washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. That's positional. Then there's progressive sanctification. That concerns your daily walk. And what is sanctification? It means separation. You've been separated unto God for a purpose. You've been separated from the world unto God. And God continues to sanctify you, which is holiness, to bring holiness in your life, to grow in holiness and draw closer to God. And that doesn't stop until the day you take your last breath. Paul's question to the Galatians was this. Are we so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are we now made perfect by the flesh? No. We are made perfect by the cross of Jesus, what He did, and through the Holy Spirit, He brings holiness. That's why He's the Holy Spirit. Amen. He continues to work in our lives. But they are trying to be sanctified by their flesh, many Christians are. That's why they still talk like a heathen. And they don't understand how to overcome that. Because they're not following after the Spirit. Amen. What is it? Romans 8 and 1. 
For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Meaning that you are in Christ, in his finished works. You have died with Christ at Calvary, baptized into his death. And it said, for those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Amen. I believe it was, uh, if you look at the book of Revelation chapter 3. Each paragraph ends with, as Jesus judges the seven churches, he says, hear what the Spirit says. Church, hear what the Spirit has to say. Praise God. Paul tells us in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with holiness with all men. That doesn't mean to compromise your bad Christian values to make peace with someone, okay? We've got to stand on the Word of God. Sure, walk in peace with all men, but never compromise the Word of God and your values to make that peace, okay? Ephesians 5, back to Ephesians 5, verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolish, means unwise, foolish talking, unwise talking, nor jesting, which is crude joking, which are not appropriate, but rather giving of thanks. Think about this. If we spend more time giving thanks to God, giving thanks to God, there would be no time for foolish talking or filthiness coming out of our mouth or crude joking. Because they're not appropriate. But rather giving thanks, it says. Like I said, if we'd spend more time giving thanks to our Heavenly Father, we wouldn't have time to be letting those things come out of our mouths. Filthiness, let's talk about these. Filthiness means obscenities such as filthy language. I hope and pray that no one here today or anyone that's listening carries on with filthy language. I did that when I was a sinner. 30 years of my life. The day didn't go by that I didn't cuss, swear, do something like that. The apostle addresses in the church of Colossus when he said, put off all filthy communication out of your mouth. Put off all filthy communication out of your mouth. Amen. And foolish talking. Paul mentions foolish talking. I call this stupid chatter. Talking stupidly. Foolishness. I'll tell you what else is stupid chatter. It's foolishness. A lot of it comes from the pulpit. And it's called believing and repeating lies. You hear lies, fibs, and repeating those things. It's called gossip. And, and, uh, but once saved, always saved is a big lie that's behind the pulpit today. I think all of us understand what that is. The unconditional, eternal security. There's no such thing, okay? Once you're saved, you still have the free will. God didn't take your free will. You can walk away if you so choose to. I pray that you don't. But I've seen it happen. I've seen people walk away and become atheists. I know that's hard to believe. And the first thing that comes out of the once saved, always saved folks, they say, well, he was never saved to begin with. And all this person served the Lord for almost 10 years in the church. But started looking at other things. He took his eyes off the Lord and started looking at science. He started believing what science says and not what the Word of God says. That's a problem. You're looking to man. Man is corrupted. Man is fallen. The word is perfect. What about Jesse? It speaks of crude joking. This is really is harmful joking. Whenever and we all joke around. We heard Dave Reaver made quite a few jokes last night. Yeah. But when we harm the character of someone or hurt someone's feelings, we gotta be careful about that. God doesn't like that. Verse 5, for this we know that no whoremonger, this is a sexually immoral person, nor unclean person, and someone who's impure in heart, they have an unclean heart, nor covetous man who is an idolater. A covetous man who is an idolater. Hmm. 
We all know what idolatry is. Idolatry is probably the worst sin mentioned in the Bible. <coughs> Idol worship. Idol worship. God hates idolatry. But let me tell you something. Idolatry almost every time brings about pridefulness, the sin of pride. That's the very sin that got Lucifer cast down, right? Pride. And idolatry will lead to pride or burst pride. And let me explain. One of the greatest examples of idolatry in the Bible was the golden calf. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and when Moses went up the mountain for 40 days to speak with the Lord, what did they do? They melted down their gold and built a golden calf, and they were proud of what they did. They worshipped it. Idolatry can bring a lot of pride in the heart of man. The aim of sin, of pride, is always idolatry. The sin of pride is idolatry. And the, the fall of Lucifer, like I just mentioned, Paul goes on to say, such people have not have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Inheritance. How does one inherit something? It's left to you, given to you, because somebody died, right? We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, if you believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you inherit the kingdom of Christ and of His God of God. Amen? But these people with idolat idolaters will not have any inheritance. Let no man deceive you with vain words. What are vain words? Useless words. Vanity means useless nothings. This can mean false preaching. When a pastor preaches false doctrine and continues and he knows he's preaching false doctrine. And a lot of times pastors preach things like they preach what the people want to hear, not what God wants them to hear. And there's a lot of that going on in the church today. Pastors and many, I give them what they want. We don't talk about sin. We don't talk about the blood. We don't talk about the cross. We talk about being rich, becoming millionaires. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear what a good person they are. They want to hear how good they are inside. And they're a good person. What did Paul say? Where there is no good that dwells in me. No, nothing. I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, Paul says. But preachers are doing this. And they're building big churches. And they're doing it through all their own self-efforts. But what does the Word of God say? In the 127th Psalm, it says, If the Lord not build the house, then he who built it labored in vain. If the Lord doesn't build the house, and it's not done God's way, then the, he who built it labored in vain. God ain't going to bless it. God does not bless when man's he doesn't bless the flesh of man what he does. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The wrath of God on the children of disobedience. God's wrath comes in the form of judgment. Judgment is in regards sickness and disease. That often happens to those that are unsaved. I know when I was that same, I got sick three, four times a year. Every two, three months, I catch a cold or I was just constantly sick. Half the time, I should have been in the hospital. I wasn't. Stubbornness there. But I was unsaved, right? And the day I got saved, I'll tell you what, I've only been sick maybe once or twice in the last 12 years. Things changed. Yeah, Christians are going to get sick. It's going to happen. We live in this world. It's a fallen world. But God's hand is on us to protect us. It's a proven fact. The studies have been done over and over. 
that Christians, and, and actually this was pointed out to me from an atheist. A friend of mine went to school with it was an atheist. At one time was saved, but walked away. Same guy that looked to science, to start believing science over the Word of God. And he said, Mark, it's a known fact. Christians live longer lives. Christians live healthier lives. They have more, they live happier lives. Everything was good. He even said, as an atheist, he said, I recommend people be Christians. You live longer and happier and healthier lives. Christians are generally uh, financially, when it comes to monetary gain, do better than that of the heathen. But he said, it's not for me, though. I don't want no part of that. I don't get it. They have, they come, often judgment comes in an unsettled, peaceless disposition. I had no peace in my life when I was a heathen. I don't know about all y'all, but look back and think. You thought you might have had peace, but it didn't last long, did it? There's no peace without Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. Amen? Amen. Financial reverses. Untold thousands of times I had financial reverses. And since I've been saved, I don't see those things anymore. My finances move forward. They grow higher, don't they, Becky? Amen. And we continue to give to the work of God. As my income increases, our giving increases, as it should be. As God blesses you, pour out more blessings to the work of God. Amen? We should do that. And God will bless you even more. The more you give to the work of God, the more He's going to bless you. Praise God, so that you can give more to the work of God. Amen. Be not therefore partakers with them. Verse 7. But be partakers with Christ. Amen. Don't partake, be partakers with that of the heathen world out there. Satan's world. Be partakers with Christ, the bread of life. Amen. Praise God. That's what we're doing today. Be partakers with Christ in His house. Amen. Verse 8 says, we're finishing up here. For ye were sometimes darkness. You know what that says? It doesn't say ye were sometimes walking in darkness. Yeah, you were. But it says ye were sometimes darkness. You we're not just walking in darkness before you got saved. You were the darkness. That's what Paul's saying. What does that mean? Sometimes darkness means in times past. You were darkness. I can remember years ago, a friend of mine coming here to church, and he said those very things. He said, after about being here about a month, he said, Mark, he said, before I came here, I wasn't just walking in darkness. I was the darkness. Was is the key. He was the darkness. He lived in darkness. He was darkness. Praise God that he was acknowledging that. He understood it. In chapter 4, Paul tells the church of Ephesus, Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Walk not as the other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Vanity, useless nothings. They're walking, the Gentiles, the unsaved, are walking in the vanity of their own minds. Useless nothings. Why would we want to go back to that? Why would we want to associate ourselves and walk as they walk, having the understanding darkened? Their understanding has been darkened. Their understanding of God has been darkened. Why would we want to go back to that? And being alienated from the life of God. They've been separated from God. Alienated to the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of their blindness of their heart. Their hearts are darkened. There's nothing good inside of them. Their hearts are darkened. You have the Holy Ghost living in you. If you are saved, you are the house of the Holy Ghost. The temple of God. Hallelujah. Your body is your temple. Your body is a temple. The temple of God. His spirit lives in you. Because you
You've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Praise God. You've been cleaned. Praise God. Declared clean. And now the Holy Ghost lives in you. What's his purpose, though? What's the purpose of the Holy Ghost living in us? What, is he, what did he come to do? To convict. When you sin as a Christian, you're going to do it. He convicts you. He convicts you and tells you, that was wrong. You need to say you're sorry. You need to repent. You need to ask God to forgive you. You need to go back and tell your wife you're sorry. You need to go back and tell your husband you're sorry. You feel that conviction. I didn't have conviction when I was a sinner. Because the Holy Ghost wasn't there to convict me. Sometimes conviction don't always come as fast as we think it should. Sometimes it may take a few minutes. It may take you to the end of the day. I remember once saying something I probably shouldn't have said. I don't even remember what it was, but it wasn't until the end of the day the Lord convicted me. When I got off work and went home, He convicted me. He reminded me of what I did was wrong. So through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, the Holy Ghost does not live in them. Basically, Paul is telling us, come out from amongst them and be separate, saith the Lord. Amen. That's what you did at conversion. As you should have. They come out from amongst the, the darkness. Those who walk in the dark, those who are darkness, you are darkness. Come out from amongst them and be separate, saith the Lord. And that doesn't stop at salvation. You don't get saved and go right back into the darkness and hanging out with people and such. And touch not the unclean thing. The unclean thing is anything that's not of God. Touch not the unclean thing. And it says here, here's the key. And I will receive you. God says, I will receive you. It's not that you receive the Lord, but He received you. Amen. He received you into His family. Praise God. You are adopted son and daughter of God. Paul also told the Colossians, He had delivered us from the power of darkness. Praise God. The powers of darkness. You've been delivered from that. No longer walk within or therein. And have translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Praise God. You're now a child of the King. Start walking like you're a child of the King. Amen. Praise God. Put away all that filthiness, that, that useless chatter, unholiness, covetousness. Put those things away. You're a child of the King. I'm going to read verses, verses. Ephesians 5 and 8 again. We'll wrap up this message. It says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Amen. Ye are light in the Lord. Because God's light is now in you. Amen. Before you got saved, you had no light in you. All, that's why they were darkness. You were darkness. The only light is the light of God. He is light. Read, what is it? First John. He is light. The light, any light that man has in him comes from God. Walk as children of light. We should be walking as children of light. And what does that mean? It means to be, if light, the only light we have comes from God, then we are to be reflectors of His light. The light that shines out from us comes from God. It's His light. Amen. If, we had, if we did have any light in us before we got saved, it's the light, the false light that Satan, he comes as an angel of light, right? That's a false light. That's not the real deal. Christ is the real deal. He is the light. Amen. Walk as children of light. Proverbs 3. Solomon says, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. 
Trust in God. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. He directs your paths. His word is a lamp and a light unto your feet. Amen. That's how it should be. The light that shines in you it should be a light unto your path or a path unto your life, whatever. <laughs> God's light. I'm going to finish with this. In the book of Matthew, Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5. If any of you want to turn there, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. I'm not even sure which verse this is. I think it might be 18. Matthew 5, 18. The Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever written by Christ Jesus. I've heard a very well-known pastor once say that if the Bible only consisted of the Sermon on the Mount, it would be enough for man. That that's all that we would need. Praise God. Jesus said, I believe it's on verse 18, he says, let your light so shine before men. Let your light shine before men. It means to be a blessing to others. That the light that God has given to you let it shine unto others. Be a blessing unto others. That they may see your good works. Let me explain that. It said that they may see what? Your good works. Not that they see you. Not that they see you doing those works. It isn't about you, but they see the result of these good works. Okay? It's not important that everyone know that you wrote out a check for $10,000 to the church. It's not everybody. Okay? They just need to know that somebody gave $10,000. I'm just using an example. Pick the numbers out of the air. Okay? If God lays down your heart to write a check for $10,000, so be it. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Just don't let it bounce. <laughs> So that they may see your good works. They see the result of your good works. And then, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. And man sees you doing it and you're like, look what I did. Who's getting the glory here? Man. That's right. We are to do our works in secret, but let them see the results of this work and what it did for the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's how we walk as children of light. To do the work of the Lord. To give to the work of the Lord. And not to boast. Paul says we boast only in the Lord. That him who boasts, boasts only in the Lord. Praise God. Him who glory, glory in the Lord. Praise God. And your heavenly Father. See, what you're doing by doing that is you're building your treasure in heaven. Don't be like the Pharisees. Went around doing their works in front of everyone. They'd stand out in the streets and, and praise God. And they would just stand up there and pray. And the people would look at him and say, oh, look at that wonderful man. He's a Pharisee. He's out there praying to God. He's such a good man. They wanted they, they wanted everybody to look at him. That's not walking as a child, children of light. So I pray that today that we all have that understanding. I'm about to wear a pat in this place. <laughs> <It's poor. Yeah. laughs> Praise God. I think Brother Reaver said it last night. Your, prayer, your pastor likes to walk when he talks. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> Amen. But uh, we are to be children of light. God's light. It's not our light. We're simply reflectors of what God is doing in our lives. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Father, I thank you today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus, hallelujah, to die on a cross that we may be saved, hallelujah. And Lord, that we have nothing to fear. Your word tells us, as children of light, your word tells us 365 times, fear not. We have one for each day. We have nothing to fear. Hallelujah. These powers of darkness, we take authority over the powers of darkness in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We have nothing to fear. Let, let our light shine. Let, our, let, let this light that you have given to us, Lord, to shine unto others, to be a blessing to others. Praise God. Praise God. 
I thank you, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to be with us. Let your spirit be with each and every one of us today as we go out of here. And Lord, that uh, we glorify you in everything we do to reconcile people unto God, to walk as children of light. And I ask you, Jesus' mighty name. Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all the saints said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Praise God.